This show's audio was via a Skype call. Views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Some comfort. You've got questions, and Light on Living puts the spotlight on all the answers so you can shine. Lift and lighten the load of life's challenges and learn simple and easy ways to live a healthy, happy life. You'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. You're invited to hear new, see different, and feel more as Lisa shines the light on living. Welcome to Light on Living. I'm Light Coach Lisa, holistic nutritionist and life coach, helping to lighten the load of life's challenges. Revealing a truth, being vulnerable, and getting honest so that you can live not just authentically, but financially, effortlessly happy. Well, money and the real capacity to buy, to obtain, and to manage materialistic things and experiences has a vibration. It has an energy to it that does go well with being spiritual, but only if we can align ourselves with money to what it means to and for us. Today, we have an authentic and spectacular and what I perceive as honestly a brave woman and author, Jennifer Noel Taylor, and she's going to share with us a true, a hardcore get real story about being in debt of over $135,000 and struggling financially without acknowledging it until after her aha moment in the back of a police car. Jennifer, who's releasing her second book called Spiritual and Broke, is about to share with us today how that all came about and how she aligned herself with money and came out on top while remaining her spiritual self and giving up nothing. Welcome, Jennifer. Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I think this is a topic that, oh my goodness, I think I could be at any point in my life of my financial life and have resonated just with the first chapter that I got to read from your book. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wrote, I, uh, I was spiritual and broke and that's why I wrote this book because I uh, was under the impression that if you do what you love, the money will come. Yeah. And so here I was, I, I quit my quote unquote real job to live my purpose. And I was amazed that the money didn't come. I was <laughs> ended up uh, going into debt, you know, um, massive debt. I was always worried about money. Um, I had a credit card that just hovered around its limit of $35,000. I had a business loan and it just was a disaster. And so I was wondering, you know, what was I doing wrong? So yeah. That's why I wrote this book, to kind of address that. Um, I have to say thank you that you did. I hope that it actually prevents a lot of people from going down that road. Like what you just said there, and I, I want to really dive into that so people connect, because like, I was reading the first chapter, and I was really connecting, thinking, not only with myself, but so many people who they are in a job they hate or just don't feel right, and so they really do believe the money will come. And I I was going to ask you, just, just to kick it all off, in your opinion then, it, if somebody, they quit their job, like yourself, and you go out, why do we, when you spent and you were spending on credit, did you think it was okay because the money would come or did you fear it while you were spending and going, oh my gosh, I hope it comes? Like, what, where was your mindset at that time? Um, I think. Yeah, my mindset was like, someday my prince will come. I believe that someday. Aww. Yeah, I believe that someday the universe would deliver and I would finally have the money. So I, uh, I, uh, you know, racked up my credit card thinking, oh, yeah, you know, this is okay because I know the money's going to show up someday. So does this mean that you don't live that way now or you just don't even, you're not even in a world that looks like that? So, yeah, so now my world looks totally different because um, once I realized what I was doing wrong with money, I ended up, I paid off all the debt. Woo-hoo! I stopped getting into new debt. So, yeah, I paid off $135,000 of debt. I stopped generating new debt, you know, so I didn't keep on perpetuating the problem. 
Um, I built a savings account, so now I have a year of savings, and I'm actually starting to invest money, which is new. Um, And uh, so, like, I changed my energy around. And then I also, you know, one of the things that, you know, bothered me about being in debt was I felt like if I didn't spend all the money I was spending, I would somehow feel deprived. So that was Mm. one of the things is that, you know, I know that we could all probably turn our finances around if we decided to pitch a tent get rid of our house, you know, live off of noodles or whatever and uh, <laughs> suffer, you know, like some yeah. diet. But I'm not that type of person, you know. I, I'm not really one to be <laughs> sacrificial like that. So right. I didn't want to do it while suffering. I Just thinking about how it's, you were talking about spiritual and broken, and, and I think a lot of us, we think that spiritual and suffering <laughs> kind of go. But that's one of the things I was really excited to read because I think – and hear from you a little bit more because, you no, know, of course, I have to know all of the things that you're writing about. But um, a lot of people really do believe, even if I was in debt, right, I would have to sit back and go, okay, I need to budget. I need to do cutbacks. I need to stop doing this. And I need to. Um, so if, if you didn't do that, probably jumping to the end of the book here, I shouldn't do that. But like if, you're, if we're not, don't want to do that, is there, how did you even, how did you even stop and say, okay, I need to, how did you stop in your, in your tracks and to recognize, okay, I'm in trouble here and I have to change my energy. Like, that's a weird thing to say to somebody, you know, like, how do we even know that? Yeah, I hear you. Well, see, the, it all started um, because I realized, first of all, um, I tried, you know, first of all, I tried to cut up my credit card and <laughs> I tried to do a budget. And so here's what happened when I cut my credit card. I cut up my credit card and I said, all right just going to stop using credit because this $35,000 credit card unsecured thing is, I, I can't even pay down the, you know, the interest charge. You know, my mm-hmm. interest charge was $800 a month and I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't even pay this off. So, yeah. um, so I cut out my credit card and I felt empowered. Like, yes, I'm doing the right thing. And then two days later I fished through the trash, oh. pulled my credit card out of the trash, taped it back together <laughs> <laughs> and called the bank and ordered a new one. And so I realized, wow, that that doesn't work. I tried a budget, and I thought, all right, I'm going to stick to this budget. And I had this spreadsheet, and I felt all, you know, happy that I was finally getting it together. And I put all these columns in for my expenses, and, and you know, yet I couldn't stick to it. That was the problem. Right. It wasn't, wasn't the spreadsheet. I couldn't do it. So that's where I started. And um and then, uh, and then I had my, my wake up call, as I call it, my aha moment in the back of a police car, which I can tell you more about. Oh, I know. I'm, I was like, oh, no, I don't want to know. I'm like, oh, God, oh, what's he do? What happened? <laughs> and I, oh, I, I know. I do want to I just say right there, because so many people are going, wait a second. I've cut up my credit cards. I've, you know, said I'm not going to go into debt anymore, but then a bill comes up, or I really do need, or um, I've done the spreadsheet, but why can't I stick to it? Um, at what point? Should we kind of look and go, I'm really not sticking to the spreadsheet? And what is the question that we ask ourselves to move away from the spreadsheet, not try to do another one? Yeah, and that's a good point. So here's something else that I noticed that was really weird. Um, When I actually did manage to cut expenses, Mm -hmm. somehow, magically, my income dropped. (gasps) Or if... Yeah, with, without really even changing anything, like it's, you know, my income just dropped. Or, and I'm sure people can relate to this one, you know, you, you, you somehow can raise your income, whether you get a raise at work or you're an entrepreneur and your revenue goes up. And then all of a sudden your expenses go up to match your new income. And I've had mm-hmm. friends that have experienced this, you know, either side of the coin. It's like somehow there was some like set point, almost like weight. You know, everyone gets mm-hmm. stuck in that one weight, and you're just, ah, I'm stuck at this weight, and I can't go higher or lower. And uh, same with, seemed like the money thing. It just seemed like I was stuck in this, you know, debt thing. Yeah. No matter what I did, I was always generating debt, even though if I magically increased my income or magically cut my expenses, I still managed to rack up debt. And, and that was the frustrating part. I'm like, something's really weird here because – you know, and I tried all the marketing things in the world, and I, it just I kept on trying stuff, and there was something just stopping it from from working. You know, I was imagining like um, something going in tandem. You know, like income goes up, um, expenses go up, it goes down, then it down, and also thinking, um, 
it's like once somebody gets a day off, they have they're still they have they have all these things they have to do, so they take a day off. But yet a zillion things more show up. But I was gonna ask when you're sitting there and you're getting you said frustrated, like you're just like frustrated. Were did you start then judging judging yourself like? from ex- an external point of view or, or an internal kind of thing, like was there any judgment that goes along with that when you're so frustrated? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, so I'm, I, um, you know, I run a company that we teach energy medicine, which we teach people that you create your reality. We teach people how to work with energy and um, generate a new reality. And yet, so here was the judgment. I said, well, I'm teaching people how to do this with their health. I can't apply what I teach to my money. And I was ashamed of myself because I, I just, hmm. it, there was a disconnect, you know, between, I almost felt like a hypocrite because I was teaching one thing, yet I wasn't able to use it in my real life. And it's just uh, for a while, I went around in the circle for years. I'm like, all right, I'm a hypocrite because I'm teaching this and I can't even use it. And this is ridiculous. And yeah, I was super judgmental about myself. So, and, and that's, again, I, I'm so excited for listeners to really go, wow, I'm actually judging myself. And um, because I'm saving the back of the police car thing till after the commercial break. <laughs> and um, what I want to ask was then, you mentioned energy medicine. So if you, you're, you're teaching energy medicine, when did you make that connection um, or how, sorry, say how did you make the connection that what you were teaching in energy medicine could be used financially? So basically, um, energy medicine, from my perspective, is based on the law of attraction, which Mm -hmm. is the whole idea that we create our reality. And that was made really popular with The Secret and and other movies like that. And um, so the law of attraction states that, you know, we're generating our reality, you know, based on, and and it's commonly taught based on our thoughts. But we attract our experience was the common theme. And then, you know, quantum physics is showing the same thing that by observing something, we collapse the wave and create a reality. So energy medicine is based on the same idea that our energy generates our health. Uh And um, so this is, you know, I've been in this field for 15 years and that's kind of the fundamental teaching of a lot of these, um, Okay. Now that is our commercial music. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but when we come back, I yeah, energy medicine about the way we create our lives. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. Welcome back to the Cat Show. Up next, we have Nico. Nico is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right. A group known especially for their sunspot sleeping, ball chasing, leg rubbing, and of course, companionship. Just look how she struts. It's like she owns the place. And see how she curls up and cuddles her person. The pitch on her purring is simply perfect. Nice one. Fantastic cat. But really the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Nico is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Art Council. And we're back. We're here with Jennifer Noel Taylor and her upcoming book, Spiritual and Broke. And before we left, we're talking about, um, well, basically, the connection of a law of attraction or creating our lives and things like that. And that what I love is that it's, in the end, it's us manifesting and creating our lives. 
And so when you're talking, we're just, I love hearing about how you took this whole energy medicine and, and put it towards your finances um, before, because I'm going to lead up to the big question, but I want to ask you, once you realize that and kind of say, wait a second, I can connect this to my financial life. How long for you, like everybody's different, but how long for you did it take to, to start noticing any change and then turning it around? Uh, it, it took me a long time because I wasn't there and, until I had my um, my aha moment in the back of the police car. I was still thinking, here's my thought. I'm like, okay, I know that we create a reality, but I'm not doing it with money, and I don't know why. Mm-hmm. And yet, no matter what I do, it's just it's I'm still in debt. And um, I was actually uh, angry at the universe, right? I was saying, well, you know, you're I'm doing my purpose, and you're supposed to give me money. And right. uh, I was also ashamed of myself because I'm like, well, I'm teaching this and I can't do it. So I called right. it my uh, secret shame. I was kind of like the personal trainer that, uh, you know, talks about eating salad and then like binges at ice cream at night. Yes. You know, I felt like that's what I was. So. Yes. And I, I do want to go into that, that, that back of the, the aha moment. I'm going to call it the aha moment because right now I'm, I'm kind of laughing the way we all say to the universe, we had a deal. I was going to do this and you're going to do that. <laughs> so. Um, okay, I'm ready for the story. It's, can you share it with us the a whole moment? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so I was in that space. Like I said, I was, you know, berating the universe. I was feeling like a martyr for the cause. I'm sure many people who work in the spiritual field sometimes feel that way, that, you know, unappreciated, a martyr. And then I had my wake-up call, and here's what happened. So one night I went to bed, and in the middle of the night, a man had broken into my house. And I didn't know he had broken into my house until he came into my bedroom. And uh, it turned into a robbery and a sexual assault. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the police have to come over and they have to evaluate the whole scene. And so as part of that, I ended up, uh, I had to get transported to the rape trauma center. So here I was sitting in the back of the police car. This is the abbreviated version. Um, I was sitting in the back of the police car. And I was a bit of a daze. It was definitely, I was really mm-hmm. traumatized. I was in a daze. I was dazed and confused. And I um, wasn't really paying attention until I heard over the radio um, one of the officers saying, we are now transporting the victim to the rape trauma center. And the word victim just, I mean, it hit my soul. I'm like, wait a minute. I teach spiritual healing for a living. I'm a light worker. I, you know, I, I teach people empowerment and here I am in the back of a police car getting labeled as a victim. I'm like, this is really, this is really messed up. Come on universe. <laughs> like how messed up can we be? And then I realized at that moment, like that victim word really bothered me. And then I realized at that moment, I was living a lot of my life as a victim. Mm-hmm. I was a victim to the universe. I was blaming the universe for my finances. I was blaming other other things for my finances, like my business partner or the government or the IRS. I was in a blame mode with my money, and it just it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, wow, I actually am a victim. I've never saw myself like that before, but it was almost like the universe was was just saying, "Yeah, you're you are acting like a victim, and and this is our perception of you." And and it was like just mm-hmm. this huge wake up call and I'm like holy moly right I just it just was it was huge I'm like I never want to be labeled as a victim ever ever again I made that declaration back there in that state and um from that moment on yeah sorry so so interesting that the most disempowering thing somebody could have ever said to you was the catalyst to you becoming your most empowered self yeah, I think sometimes the, the I mean, you know, sometimes that happens where, you know, uh, somebody says something really negative to you or something. You're like, wait a minute, I'll show you. You know, it can mm-hmm. come to help you, you know, really find that internal resource when something really negative happens. Like you, you go in deep and say, no, 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 I can, I can do this. I'm better than this. Yes, I said, it's funny. I used to, I. I'll say I, I've grown up, so to speak, thinking I really hated when somebody would say that they're going to do it to show somebody else. I'm thinking, like, you're not doing it for yourself. But it's such a struggle that way because you really, you, when one does it for themselves, um, it, but because of it, perhaps it's the way. I, do, you, do you believe, or do you ever talk about the term like money karma? Do you ever believe that there's a, um, a karmic reason around it? 
Um, what I believe actually is that uh, I, I believe that a lot of light workers like um, come in with a, a history, let's say maybe mm. a past life history of being martyrs for the cause, mm. of being a victim for their cause, right? And um, I think that's a long lineage that I see is like the martyrhood is really common among a lot of the spiritual healers and light works that I run into. So in that way, I feel like maybe there's like a karmic past life energy that's carried forward. Okay. Yeah. Well, that yeah. makes sense a lot. Um, yeah. Like, you know, you know, stories of being burned up at the stake for your cause mm. or uh, like a lot of that, right. You know, all this horror, so I think that can carry over into our, our present lifetime. That is so true. So we're, um, when I think about walking as like the martyr, or martyr for the cause, and, and also, too, because it's kind of true that we do get, well, we seem to get more sympathy or assistance or help when we are a victim, like something's been done to us. And so when you have that moment and you decide, okay, wow, I don't want to be a victim. That's not me. I don't even teach this. This is not what I represent. Um, going from, let's call it the victim or martyr stage, what is your first, how does one get to the next step of that other flip side of the coin? That's a good question. So, you know, how do you really go from being the martyr into yeah. a state of ownership, right? And Ownership, um, yeah. Oh, good word. Yeah, ownership <laughs> is what I call it, right? Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I feel like there's... It's, it's difficult on one level because there's so much tragedy and trauma that happens in our world that it's hard not to feel like a victim. Mm -hmm. And with the money state, you know, it's really hard not to feel like a victim because uh, I felt like taxes were inevitable. Mm -hmm. I felt like there there could be circumstances outside of my control. Um, I think that's where a lot of the victimhood comes from. It's like we have no control over this. This is just happening to us. And... Um, Making that transition is a really brave step in consciousness because what you're saying to yourself is that no matter what, I take ownership of my life, no matter what. And that's really brave, and it can be really hard, and you are giving up the, your own internal sympathy, you know, going around bemoaning your victim state and eating a pint of ice cream on the couch and watching <laughs> TV as your way to cope. Um you, you, you have to move beyond that, and um, and it's hard. I wouldn't say it's easy. I would say it's more like a process because even mm. now, you know, even now sometimes I have that victim -y day where I'm like, ah, this <laughs> customer did this and blah, 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 right? And I have this whole internal dialogue, and I still pull out some comfort food and sit in front of the TV and be on my victim status. But at the same time, I recognize what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of giving up like an addiction where you, you know, if you've been doing it all your life, if you've been taught that you're a victim your entire life and you've been in this victimly state for most of your life, you know, your parents were that way and your your siblings and, you know, your peers are that way and this whole victim thing is going around and feeling like a martyr for the cause is somehow, uh, you're somehow a hero in your own, in your own mind for that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. giving up this massive entrenched so many layers to it, right? So whenever I get into that state, though, I, I do a practice where I give myself permission to be a victim with the full knowledge that I'm being a victim, mm. while at the same time recognizing that I'm empowered. So my dialogue may go something like, well, okay, I'll let myself be a victim today, but I know I'm just participating in a victim consciousness, and I'll do it for a day. I'll be moaning around and eat junk food or whatever with the awareness that I'm being a victim. Why I love what you're saying. It's okay to sulk just today. <laughs> yeah. um, you just really highlighted um, a, me a flashback memory. Sorry that I was. Um, I think I, I might have been four. Let's say it. And we are my family. Our family. Our home. Similar, like not very similar, but similar to what you had said. There's there was a break in, and we had been robbed. But we had actually been robbed three times in one year. And I remember my mom crying over our. Like, we had baby jewelry, and she said you know what, you can just never have anything nice. Somebody will always steal it from you. Mm -hmm. And and that and I didn't realize how much it resonated because for a long time after that, especially with jewelry, I said, no, 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 I will just wreck it. I'll lose it. Somebody will take it. I never want, you know, nice things in general. But I just am now. You were just literally making me have an aha moment why 
I like never want nice jewelry because I'm going to ruin it or lose it or somebody will steal it. And that's so neat that there's these, um, we really do have, whether it's past life or it's this life or what's what's coming from it. Um, and talking about nice things, because you really did highlight, and I love that you said that, is a lot of us feel that um, we have to let go of things or be uncomfortable to to get back on that path. Mm-hmm. Like a financially yeah, comfortable and, path. Yeah, and, you know, that was also a belief. That was all part of my victim mentality. Is like, oh, now i got to sacrifice to get my money back in line or i got to sacrifice to help others. That's a big one. I right. gotta sacrifice myself to help others. So many healers are in that mode, and I was too. Somehow right. it's more virtuous to to be that to sacrifice yourself or sacrifice your well being. And sometimes I still do it. You know, you get to that phase where you, you have, you know, for me, I have sometimes trouble setting boundaries with people and saying, okay, now I need time to myself. Mm. I need my hour to do my thing. You know, and, and I recognize, oh, here I go again. Here I am. I'm sacrificing myself. Mm. And the thing is, though, I believe now that when you're sacrificing yourself, it's really hard to actually help somebody because if you're not fully able to be fully present because there's a part of you that feels resentful, mm. a part of you that feels somehow victimized by helping another person, you're actually just perpetuating the whole victim consciousness throughout the next generation. Right. Oh my goodness. That's so true. Many times we just sit back and we get into that space. Um, when you say about, oh, okay, just a heads up, the commercial is going to come in a minute. So I, I'm going to get this question out. <laughs> and then, um, when I'm, I'm, I can't even imagine, I'm excited to hear about the chapters that are in this book other than the first one that's just so connecting and so resonating for so many people. Um, you're speaking of like a lot of coaches and um, healers and light workers who are doing this. And for the people who, who aren't, they're the ones who are actually seeking coaching and light workers to help them. How would they recognize, I'm leaving this commercial for, uh, question for the commercial, how would they recognize that they can take that step to ask for help and stop being a victim. So when we get back, that's when we let you think about that one. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this, she even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg roll showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. And we're here. We're sharing this time with Jennifer Noel Taylor, spiritual and broke, but getting away from the broke side. <laughs> and um, 
Jennifer, I guess I'm just so excited because I love that you said this is a process and what you've written is really a guide. And so when I'm thinking of a guide, I want everybody so much just to, to figure out where do they even start, whether, you know, it's finding their worth and, you know, how much they're dictating that what their salary is or their pay and all that versus on the other side, like, it's just even themselves, where, how do they recognize that point and say, I am looking for help, but I, should they even spend money on help? Because once they're already in debt and now they need help to get, to get out of debt, but should they then spend money on the help they need? Or like, it's kind of like a financial question. <laughs> That's a great question. So, okay, so first of all, um, the first thing that I recommend that people do is just an awareness of when they feel like a victim. Uh And it's amazing how much that creeps into your life. Even in my life right now, some days I have those uh, victim-y thoughts, and it's just a a higher-level awareness that whenever – and it's usually with your feelings that lead you in. So you may be feeling depressed or um, like – you know, not interested in life or, you know, all these types of feelings and recognizing, okay, I'm depressed because I feel like I'm never going to get anywhere or, you know, Mm. whenever you have those things and then countering it with this idea that, wait a minute, that's a victim thought and what does an empowered thought look like? So it's almost like Um. catching your, your um, thought process as it happens and just an awareness. And again, like if you want to have some fun and Stay in the victim thing for a while. That's okay. Just just be aware that you're doing it. Um, mm-hmm. Another example I like to give is like let's say you want to emotionally eat because um, you want quote unquote comfort food. So if you want to do that, just say okay now I'm emotionally eating and yeah. just you know just get that awareness because that can help with you know your your diet for example. Just an awareness of why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so that's the first step. Um, as far as uh, paying for coaching or paying for help. Um, I'm a big advocate of using coaching. However, I believe that following your own guidance is, is instrumental to deciding the best step for you. So, um, for example, um, I, uh, even when I was in debt, I worked with coaches and healers mm-hmm. and, um, but when I took, you know, when I moved out of the victim consciousness, There were a few people, I was working with a lot of coaches and healers, and there were a few coaches and healers that I stopped working with just naturally because I felt like, okay, here's, I'm at a new level of consciousness now, so I followed my own guidance on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You you know, following your own guidance is free. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> do, do you think um I there's a, a a comment or a statement that I've heard before is um don't live in someone else's pocket, and I want to ask you about this. Is I, I, not everybody on I, on some level, I guess everybody does, but how do we c- maybe not catch ourselves, but be aware of ourselves when we're when we're either impressed by other we. are we're imagining somebody else has a wealth status that maybe they don't or that we're imagining a poverty status that maybe they don't. And then we're judging it, comparing ourselves. Ooh, that's a juicy question. Ooh, I mean, yay. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's hard to live in someone else's pocket. It's kind of small in there. But, um, yeah, so so anyways, um, so let's do one of the wealthy people. Okay, so people you may perceive as, oh, they just bought a $5 million home. How good for them? How sucky for me? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Judgment, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I think that's, that actually ties into feeling like you're disempowered, like you couldn't do that yourself. Like, oh, oh they can do it, but I can't. <gasps> and, oh. yeah, so recognizing the fact that, well, if they can do it, why can't I? You know, mm. let them be an inspiration rather than a, a source of pain. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, as far what as people the- who, yeah, um, who, like, who you may feel like are in poverty, right? Um, you may yeah. feel like they're really struggling and saying, well, you know, they're, they don't have their act together. They're total losers. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's one of the things of where I like to remind myself, uh, you know, we never really know where someone's coming from. We mm. never really know maybe, maybe. They just got divorced, maybe they, you know, whatever. Like we can, we have to, we can never judge a person because we don't really know their story. Maybe their house burnt down. You know, it's usually out of their own pain that they're like that. So having some compassion, I think, can really help there. Yeah. 
Oh, I love that. And I think, too, to not take either of them to an extreme, like having too much compassion that we give away. Like maybe there's somebody, maybe they're super wealthy. Their house did just burn down. And now they're in their, you know, that middle time that they're waiting for the insurance to help or whatever, or, you know, just build back up. But then we feel so too much compassion, like over that we give so much that we cost ourselves. Debt, yeah, I like, call that overcare. Yeah, yeah, where you overgive, and that's another thing, the martyr thing. Oh. You know, the the old joke about um, I did all this for you. You know, like having the mom that gives you a guilt trip for giving yes. it to you. You know, like we don't want to be that either. <laughs> but, Actually, bringing up mom, um, did you have family and friends around you who um, did not support your turnaround? You know, that's a great question. Actually, um, most, uh, you know, my actually family and friends and, and partner have been very supportive, which is oh. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's very encouraging to to turn that around. And, and my employees in the business has, has loved the effects because, <laughs> the, you know, the amount of stress that their job has gone down. They're not always constantly worried that we're going to be going out of business next week. Which let me tell you this, it helps your employees if you if your company's not on the verge of going out of business. They like their job better. Right. I just that's that I find isn't interesting because there's a two ways. Some people think, um, if say I'm the owner or boss of something and I think, Oh, I want to make sure my my employees feel secure and safe and they all know, then I think maybe they won't at first you could think, Oh, they're gonna feel great and they'll they'll be more productive but then also they think, Oh, but maybe they won't feel like we do need that money and that, you know, maybe I should tell them, No, we we need to worry a little just so we can keep this going and that's a fine line then probably even on our own our own pocketbooks. You know, um what I've learned um over the years is that I I've been uh, running a business for fifteen years and this comes down to the idea of like what actually motivates people to do their job. You know, um, I'm sure we've all had uh, experiences with perhaps underperforming people that work for us. And it, it's been a really interesting journey to understand that. And I found that, okay, fear is a great motivator, but it's not necessarily going to get you where you want to go. I mean, when you're doing things out of fear, I feel like you're just trying to avoid problems. Mm. And, um, and And that doesn't seem to work because really – you know, as soon as the problem's over, you're going to go back to where you were because you just, you're just acting mm -hmm. like almost like you're living life from this defensive perspective of just staying out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't find that ever gets you anywhere. You just kind of stay at that break even kind of like, well, I'm bored with my life, but at least I'm not having any major drama. So right. that's not very much fun. But, mm -hmm. um, so the next, yeah. So the next level that I noticed is that if your employees or the people around you are inspired to take mm -hmm. action, inspired by their work, inspired by others, inspired by their job, inspired by what you're doing, um, that actually is the most productive. Because we work mm -hmm. best when we're inspired, not just trying to avoid problems. <laughs> That's what I found. Mm -hmm. out. Yes. I mean, it's definitely the one that feels the best too, right? Like we're thinking about it and doing that. Um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I know the book's not out quite yet. First of all, when is the book out? And... Um, can you walk us through some of the chapters? Like, what can we expect when we do get to read your book? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so the book, I'm aiming to bring it out um, early next year. I'm okay. still working on the writing piece. And um, some of the stuff that I that I really work on covering is, first of all, you know, how does the universe actually work? Like, what is the law of attraction what actually creates our reality, what generates our reality. I, I dive into this topic a lot. I dive into the victim piece, but then I look at what does it mean to create our reality? I mean, if we say that we attract our experience, what actually attracts it? Mm -hmm. Because what I noticed within myself is that just thinking good thoughts didn't seem to affect my bank account that much. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm thinking good thoughts, but my bank account still in the negative. So it's not mm -hmm. just your thoughts from my perspective. Um, so I delve into this topic a lot. I explore it, like what actually creates who we are, what actually creates our external experience. Um, from there, um, I delve into ways of, of how to really turn your ship around financially with, with everything that I did. And I cover topics such as uh, self-worth. Like what if, you know, you're not making any money? 
um, I deal mm-hmm. with how do you, what do you do next? I mean, okay, I'm going to take ownership of the money. What's next? So I cover that and it's different for everyone. That's one of the key mm-hmm. points that I make is that the path to turning your money around is really different. So how do you find a unique path? Cause I don't, I don't necessarily believe in just, all right, here's the formula. Have fun. You know, I don't mm-hmm. believe in that. So, um, cause everyone's different. Um, I cover, um, some of the things that I was dealing with, like, why is my housing cost so high? What am I doing wrong here? And that kind of stuff, like how to naturally, um, deal with your, you know, some things you may be spending too much money on, but not even aware of it, how to figure out your, your hidden expenses. And I know this a lot because I was doing what I call hidden expenses major time. And I wasn't even aware of how much I was spending on certain things. So that's a big topic for me. Because we're justifying those things and they'll say, no, 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 that's justifiable. <laughs> um, you, you bring yeah. up the word um, worth. And I do want to talk about um, worth. I think that's such an interesting word. But the word um, deserve really comes up to me. And that's what I'd love. And when we still have two minutes for core commercial, but when I think about people putting things on credit card, even myself, I'm going to, I'm going to really be vulnerable here and say this. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of the word deserve, but I, it's probably the meaning of it's floating around in there. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I deserve this because I'm doing this. I need this for this. Mm -hmm. And, and because I deserve it, quote unquote, and say it's a a tool of sort that I'm going to use in my practice. And then it will come back to me later. Like what you were saying earlier, I'm doing my spiritual work. It's going to come back to me. Um, I just wonder if we could really explore worth, deserving, and credit, because to me, credit really is the perceived worth and value. And I wonder that connection, you know, what all that rolls into one. Yes, I agree. And and I look forward to diving into that. That's awesome. Thanks for I know. That. Thank you. I'm going to set that question up. And so um, in this last little bit, I do want to say the name of the book again is Spiritual and Broke. It's Jennifer Noel Taylor. Book is not out yet, but it will be. And let me tell you, I've read the first chapter. I'm already sitting on pins and needles. I have no idea what's going on. I'm really connecting. I'm really relating to everything and thinking that a million people are as well and plus. And you just really hold us in suspense on the back of that police car thing. So everybody really needs to read that one. So when we're back, worth, credit, perceived value, desire, desire, everything. <laughs> Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. Me, a cat, moving in with a new human. It took a little getting used to. She has these weird games she likes to play, like this giant feather. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. It's almost like she thinks I enjoy it. But seeing how much fun she gets out of it, well, I guess it makes it all worth it. Humans. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. <laughs> All right, we've got Jennifer Noel Taylor, spiritual and broke, talking to us. And I left off basically, in a nutshell, saying when or even is it okay to justify credit usage? Hmm. That is a great question. So when is it okay to justify credit usage? Loaded. And it's loaded. Um, 
Yeah. I, I used to have this attitude, well, I deserve this. I've been working hard. The universe should be giving me this. It's not. So it's going on my card. And uh, that's how I ended up racking up so much debt because you know, a lot of the belief that I should have this, it was a, a feeling of entitlement. Ooh. I, I should have this or I'm entitled to it even though I can't afford it. Um, and I believe that there's a difference between entitlement and worth. So oh. entitlement is that feeling like the universe owes me this. Okay. This is not pain. I'm putting it on my card. Um, worth is saying like I I'm I am love. I am connected. I am fulfilled as I am. Mm. And letting that spill out into the world. So there's entitlement comes from I'm not enough, whereas worth comes from yes, I'm worthy, I'm and then it's going out into the world. And those are completely different energies. The entitlement actually plays with the victim because mm. it, it says I'm a victim, so I should be entitled to this. So I'm giving myself what somebody owes me by putting it on my card, and now I owe. See how that whole, it's like a circular consciousness. It's all the same theme. Whereas worth says, okay, here's my rate. Here's what I'm charging for my service. Here's how much I should get paid um, for my job. Here's, you know, here's what I am. And that's completely different from my perspective. Oh, I'm so 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 happy that you clarified and shared that with us. I actually this is this is crazy good. I literally had a question. That I was like, "Are we charging?" You actually said this is my rate charge. I was going to ask you, are people for whatever service they do, are they charging for the the rendered service, the healing, or the whatever? Are we charging for our time? And and where are we basing? the belief of worth on like, and what I'm hearing you saying is no, you, we've got to base it on our worth, not the results worth. Give me off on that one. Yeah. Well, okay. So yeah. So charging money for service. So let's say you're doing healing work and you want to charge a money. Um, so what you base it on, I feel like is you're not necessarily charging for the love, right? I mean, mm. it's the same thing as let's say you go to a store and there's all a bunch of produce. Now produce mm-hmm. grows for free on trees. So what you're really paying for is not the actual produce, but all the work it took for someone to get the produce and and put it in the store and package it and all that. Um, As a healer, what you're charging for is is a couple of things. It's not necessarily just your pure love that you're channeling through because that's spirit. That's Mm -hmm. quote free. Um, What you are charging for is your time and expertise and what you're Mm -hmm. bringing to the healing session, which you may have spent thousands and thousands of dollars doing all the training plus your time plus here's another thing that people don't even think about um when a client pays for a healing session they are more committed to their healing and that's the thing i learned if you're giving away healing for free or undercharging the client is less committed you know Mm. i've noticed that whenever i've given workshops away for free the people that get that free workshop are the people that generally show up late if they show up at all and they show up completely not into it or they, they just don't show up committed to the workshop because it's free. So mm-hmm. you're actually helping the client by charging them money so they can commit to their own healing. And that, I believe, is one of the biggest gifts is allowing the client to commit to the process. Oh, I love it. Commit to the process. I love that. Commit yeah. to the process. And that's really what it, the process is huge. And I love that. Um, when, and talking about the process, because when you're talking about the difference between entitled um, and worth and one being the victim and one being the, the I am, I am love, I am compassion, I am these things is I'm going to, I feel like I'm asking, is that the secret? I'm going to, I'm going to say you talk about becoming in a, um, in alignment with money. Is that, is that the technique to become an alignment, good alignment with money is the I am? That's part of it. Part of it is just realizing where you're seeking fulfillment because mm-hmm. part of that whole victim entitlement thing is it stems from feeling unfulfilled as you are. And that deals with the self-worth stuff. You know, if you don't feel fulfilled as you are, you're more likely to undercharge. You're more likely not to ask for that raise. You're more likely to show up in a corner and not take action. You're more likely to spend more money because you feel unfulfilled. So you're Uh, seeking it outside of yourself. So really what I'm talking about is 
is how that feeling of lack actually translates into problems in your life. And that usually starts from that victim standpoint. So finding your fulfillment will actually change your whole perspective on life. And that's part of what I'm what I'm talking about. Oh, I love that. Where does the feeling of lack translate in your life? Oh my goodness. Ah! <laughs> yeah. That's such a great question. And um and the fact that you do relate it to yes, if I'm feeling a lack, I'm like, Oh, if I just had this or if I could just do the, you know, spend money and get that or or buy something for somebody else because maybe we have a lot if we're feeling a lack in a in a relationship that we have with a friend or a lover or something and we're like, Oh, I want to buy them a pre or children even I want to buy them something to replace that whole that whole that feeling of lack of, that we're not maybe offering enough not enough but um connecting with that love and compassion or support or whatever that could be yeah and I have I have a few examples so for example yes. um if you're not feeling attractive you know as women sometimes we want to feel attractive to men you know yes. sometimes that that used to dictate my behavior a lot Right. Um, I'm not feeling attractive or accepted or, you know, this date flaked on me or somebody disrespected me. And, you know, I used to link it to this idea, well, if I were more attractive, they oh. would treat me better. So I would end up, oh, well, I think I'm going to go buy a new dress, some shoes, you know, I'd more makeup and I'd spend money on things that, to be honest, I didn't even like that much. Right. But I was buying it because I was trying to become, quote unquote, more attractive because, and and here's the kicker. I was seeking fulfillment through men, mm. not through just connecting with source and being who I am. And that was taking me away from my authentic self. Oh. So that's, that was just, that was one of my wake-up calls. I'm like, why am I buying this pair of shoes? You know, it wasn't because I actually liked the shoes. Or So, you know, one of the things that to take a look at, which I describe in my book, is are you spending money on things you actually love? yourself right or are you spending money on something you don't love but it has like a purpose to it other mm. than just because you connect with it and I realized that the most of my expenses were things that I didn't love at all I had all the helpful oh. stuff I didn't love right what, right. About what do you really connect to what do you own that you really love it's actually very few things that You're right when I found when I go shopping and I look at what do I really love it's it's a very few things, right? That's what I right. think myself. And probably not not even expensive, possibly even free. Like it could be like a, a rock that is, you know, you picked up off the beach or something. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> But yeah. um, we, we still really do have three minutes and we can get a lot in because I wanted to just say one little thing because I think this is great. If you could relate us to right now, because I do believe the way, not that we treat everything, but the way we treat one thing is the way we treat all things, like just of our base kind of thing. And there's a lot of people out there even with um, their they're thinking if they lost weight, let's say, that like what you said, they'd be treated better or they'd get the job or they would have more money and all these things. Um, if if following, so somebody's going to get, you know, spiritual and broke. And I'm feeling like the people are going to realize that, no, I can be spiritual and that's actually how I'm going to be get, get out of being broke. Um, if you could confirm or deny that and then and just say and just let us know like when they finally somebody gets your book and they get to go through this guide and step by step um it how what could share with us what your like what your transformation looks like like looks like right now so that we can really motivate them inspire them to to get this help oh okay so i'll give you a before and after so the yes. before was one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars of debt i had a mortgage i could afford i had a car payment I couldn't make my payments on the credit card. I've actually bounced payroll. Um, <gasps> and I was always stressed about, about money. And it never seemed like there was enough. And um, so, and the after right now is I have no debt. And I've, I've been at this process for three years only. So I, I, I got rid of the $135,000 of debt. I have no debt. Yeah, it's awesome. I have no car payment. I owe my car outright. Um, I, uh, also have, uh, about a year of all saved. Like I could live oh my off God. my savings for a year now. Oh, wow. So I have enough for a down payment on a house. I wanted one. Um, and so you uh, do so have a house. It's not that you pitched that tent. You do have a house and you have a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not living in a tent. I actually, I actually rent right now, which is great. Um, I rent a place on Maui. So I live in Hawaii, um, I love, 
Um, but the nice part is, you know, I have that year of savings for those unexpected expenses. Like I could put my, not that I would, but I could put my job and live on my savings for a year if I wanted to, or maybe a little more now. And so, but the, but the whole thing is I'm consistently saving and I don't feel like it's a struggle, which is the most important part. I'm really relaxed about the money thing now. You know, and I think that's, yeah, that's a huge takeaway for everybody to hear that is that when you go through this process, it's, you don't feel like you're struggling. And I want to commend you, first of all, of being so brave, honestly, to be so vulnerable to share. And then, and to, you know, people are going to judge or they're not going to judge. And I just think you're so absolutely wonderful and, and helpful and, and such a good leader to let people know the bravery that you had to go through to do that, to tell everybody this and, and to really celebrate all the, the, the riches, I'm going to use that word, the riches that you have and you're so spiritual. So I want to thank you so much for being on the show um, and for sharing your story. And please invite anybody to your, your Facebook page or website. Where can they find you right now? And then we'll say goodbye. Oh, okay. Well, I really appreciate it. You're such a great host and I just love being on your show. This has been a great time and um, I think you're awesome. And anyways, um, if you want to find out more about me, um, you can go to my website, which is jennifernoeltaylor.com. It's just my name all together, uh, jennifernoeltaylor.com. And I have a mailing list, so if you want to know yes. what comes out or free gifts, sometimes I send out free stuff. That's Perfect. Yes, everybody, go sign up for her list and get the book soon. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We'll talk to you soon again. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. This show's audio was via a Skype call. 